Hello, and welcome to AI Curious. My name is Jeff Wilser. I'm a journalist, I'm a human, and I am curious about AI. So in this episode, to be frank, we're gonna get back to the fun stuff. As regular listeners of the pod know, for the past several weeks, I've been focusing on some of the more important but sober aspects of AI. Deep fakes, risks to the 2024 election, the risk of runaway AIs doing bad things, and so on. But today, we're going to get back to some meat and potatoes. How can AI actually help you at your job and in your life. There's a growing cottage industry of AI productivity gurus out there who are always talking about the hot new AI tool and how AI will magically supercharge everything you do. But often these claims are vague and hypey and almost overwhelming and hard to follow because they shill a new tool every day. Our guest today, Sam Stevens is different. Sam wears a few different hats in the AI space. She's the co-founder of an AI startup called Catalyst AI that's building new project management tools. She's a former product lead at Google and YouTube where she worked on AI before it was cool. She's an AI educator. She writes an AI newsletter that has maybe the best name of any newsletter I've ever seen dedicated to chat GPT prompts and AI efficiency called prompt and circumstance. <laughs> but mostly, above all else, Sam's advice is extremely pragmatic. She gets into the nuts and bolts. She doesn't just tout the possible benefits of using ChatGPT. She shows in detail how she's using it in her own life. So that's what we do in this conversation. We walk through step-by-step step, how she gets the most benefit out of ChatGPT. She shares how she tweaks her prompts to get the best answers. She gives a hyper specific example of how she used ChatGPT to transform a 40 hour project into a 30 minute task. And I definitely learned some tools and tricks that I will be incorporating into my own workflow. Honestly, this is the kind of stuff that many AI influencers like charge a good chunk of money to reveal and she's giving it to, to us, to you for free. In short, this is probably the most functional, pragmatic and useful podcast I've recorded to date and I'm reasonably confident you'll get something out of it. This might even be a good starter episode of AI Curious, so feel free to forward this to others who haven't yet boarded the train. But for now, please enjoy my conversation with Sam Stevens, co-founder of Catalyst AI and writer of the newsletter Prompt and Circumstance. Sam, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much. Great to be here. One thing I love about your work is it's so pragmatic and functional. It's not kind of a pie in the sky. Here's how an AI could help you. You actually give some very concrete suggestions of how to use AI in your actual life. So with that kind of North Star in mind, let's start with some of your favorite productivity use cases for AI. I know it's a very broad topic, but let's start with personal productivity. Oh man, well, the use cases are obviously infinite. I have ChatGPT open in my browser. I have ChatGPT, my calendar, and my Gmail all in like my first three tabs next to each other. So it's my constant desktop companion. Mm. I find myself primarily using it as a thought partner, whereas I'm trying to um, you know, navigate my day across various different roles. I'm a startup founder. I'm um, an educator right now. Um, as I'm trying to figure out, hey, what's the best way to explain mm -hmm. um, the difference between these concepts to students? Does this explanation make sense? Does this analogy make sense? I'll put it into, I primarily use ChatGPT, so I'll put it into ChatGPT and help it and use it to help me kind of frame my thinking and explore an idea to really help me hone it down and distill it. Love that. And I do want to dive deeper on the thought partner use case later. I think it's a really great one. Let's talk about some other kind of go-to use cases for you. How about project management? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that uh, people tend to be really bad at is prioritization and time management. And what machines are really good at is 
generally prioritization and time management because there's a lot less emotion, a lot mm-hmm. less uh, brainwashing yourself into believing that something is possible in an amount of time that it's probably not. And so I found that with an LLM for personal productivity, for personal project management, let's call it, um, there's one of the ways that I like using it is uploading my to-do list in addition to my calendar, right? I'll tell it like, here's all the meetings I have today. Here's all of my to-do lists. Here's like the things that I really have to do, make a schedule for me. And so I wish there was then an integration that would like schedule it on my calendar because that would be clutch. There's not yet. I could probably program it with like a Zapier type of thing. Um, But yeah, having it figure out like, it's probably going to take you, you know, it'll, it'll tell me things like, set aside 30 minutes for emails, right? Do you want to take a lunch break? And I'm like, oh yeah, I probably should like factor that in and not just assume that I'm going to, you know, have time throughout my day. And so I'll use it to time block, to help me prioritize. Um, I've even developed prompts. So I'll use that prompt and tell it like, here's my energy levels throughout the day, Hmm. right? I'm really not a morning person. I really do most of my deep thinking between like, you know, 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. And I'll tell it all of these things about myself um, and then give it the data from my to-do list and let it help me create that time block schedule. That's so interesting. I imagine one of the real challenges there, and it sounds like you've developed workarounds, how do you give it enough context about your tasks and about you to know how much space and time for each task and when to do it? So like another way to ask this question, if I just gave, if I thought about my 13 things I need to like bang out for tomorrow, like it would even take me a, a little bit of time to figure out, okay, geez, what's super important? Why does it matter? What's involved in this? Um, how can you maybe give another example or two of what you tell it? Like how much context do you give it for each task to help it figure out is it an hour thing, two hours, or do you give it the amount of time you think each one will take? And then also, what's your secret for scaling this? I mean, scaling longitudinally, if you will, so you don't have to do the same thing every time, but do you like store these prompts or, and then kind of ask, start a new chat each time and repeat the process and you have kind of like a, a template, you just kind of pump in there? Or do you have some long chat GPT conversation that's going over weeks or months and you're just constantly adding that combo? So it's already kind of stored the context for these tasks and maybe it even eventually evolves and learns what tasks are important. This is a very long long winded question, Mm -hmm. but how do you get it to be more personalized and think about tasks in the right way. Yeah. I actually, I have not tried just using one long conversation. I feel like that's a great idea. Maybe I'll try it. I'm always afraid that eventually it will, the context will get too long and it'll either Mm -hmm. forget or run out of space or whatever. Um, But what I do is I keep a spreadsheet of all of my prompt templates that I've kind of tweaked and iterated over time. And so I will just start a new chat. Um, every time and fill out that information kind of in that templated form. I give it the information that I would as if it were a, a human, right? Like you have mm. to, it's, it's the qual. it's like garbage in garbage out. And so if you're mm. not going to put in the time to like really delegate, then you won't get like super high quality information out as we all know. Um, mm. But I think what AI is really good for, and it does go back to that concept of like, being a thought partner is it will give me a first draft and then let me change the way that I'm thinking about what my schedule in this case, right? From a state of me first having to generate it to the lens of being the editor or the judger and saying, oh, wait, that's actually going to take me more than an hour. You know, let me make that mm-hmm. tweak. Let me iterate with this system to like provide it feedback and get to the point where I'm like, yeah, this is, you know, shippable, let's say. Mm-hmm. Um, And so that might take, you know, a couple of rounds of back and forth, but ultimately, you know, this whole process maybe takes like five to 10 minutes and sets me up for success throughout the day. So you have to tell it the right amount of things, give it, you know, your, your constraints, your requirements, your objectives, all of those things that you would do, you know, kind of on your own naturally, but it would take a lot of brain power and a lot of brain energy to go through your day and be like, 
okay, what are my constraints? What are my requirements? Let me do all of this, like, you know, schedule gymnastics, et cetera. But instead I just brain dump that into, you know, a chat GPT and let it do it for me. And then I can edit it and refine it. How often do you do this? Is this part of your daily routine? Yeah, I usually do it daily. I mean, there are certainly days where uh, there are just pure fire drills, or I know that I'm just focused on one thing. Um, but, you know, I do try to make it like a personal productivity habit to do this daily and have really good um, calendar hygiene where I do time block out all of my to-do lists and activities. And so I, it's also a great way to keep track of what I did, um, you know, throughout the week and make mm. sure I understand where my time went. Um, and I could probably even take a screenshot of my calendar and upload it into uh, like the the vision, you know, GPT-4 vision version of the app and say like, you know, give me an analysis of where my time was spent this week and give me some suggestions for next week on um, how I could, you know, do it better because I'm trying to, you know, I don't know, I have my performance review coming up or I want to work on these more strategic things or have X, Y, and Z sorts of objectives. I love that. You mentioned constraints and requirements. What are some, maybe an example or two of what you would tell it and other contexts that you have fed it to make sure it's optimizing things? Yeah. So a constraint might be like, um, I have a doctor's appointment this morning, um, or, you know, it's like a, a timing constraint. Um, or it might be like, you know, a requirement might be like, I have, I have to get this thing done today. I have this deadline. Um, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Totally. Totally. In the same way, again, same way you tell a plucky trusted assistant, you say, Hey, this has to happen by three. Um, that, that's great. How about an adjacent topic, but not quite the same, uh, setting goals, priorities, and kind of project planning. So saying, all right, I have this big end goal. I have this presentation due next Tuesday, or I am designing this new product that's due to market in six months, or I have, I'm starting a new company, a new startup. I want to go to VCs in October of this year, right? Mm -hmm. Have you experimented with giving ChatGPT or any other AI tool end goals and then helping it chunk out what the midterm steps would be and give you advice on how to accomplish those goals? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good use case for it as well. Um, you can certainly, it's another thing humans are really bad at is uh, creating, you know, actionable, achievable, achievable goals. There are entire courses and blogs and books on smart goals and how to set goals and how to break those down into measurable steps and all of these things. So it's not something that comes, I think, naturally to every single person. Um, so another, you know, certainly a great use case for um, an LLM is to put in a very high level objective, right? Mm -hmm. I want to um, launch a product, let's say. Um, it has a lot of information about how other humans on the planet have launched products and talked about it on the internet and how that happens, right? And so you can say, I want to launch it. You give it your constraints or your requirements, right? I want to launch it in six months from now. I have these resources at my disposal. Maybe I have a little bit of money. Maybe I have a few people. Maybe I know where my, um, I can tell it where I know that like, I'm going to face challenges, whether that's a lack of resources or some other like complications. And you can give it all of this information that you possibly can and have it, you know, create that. Uh, I would first ask it to kind of create milestones along the way for me. So mm -hmm. break down a big goal into action, into like specific milestones, um, maybe on like a monthly basis or just maybe not on a time basis, just on a, you know, more qualitative basis. And then once I have my milestones, now I would have it give me like a daily schedule or a weekly schedule of like, what do I need to achieve every single day or every single week to make sure that I hit the milestones and then hit my ultimate goal. As an aside, I know there are writers who listen to this podcast. This strikes me as an excellent use case. If you have a book due at some point, mm -hmm. telling it, hey, the yeah. first draft is due to my editor on July 1st. Mm -hmm. Um, and I need to do all my research and I need to do X, Y, Z, like give me a book writing project plan that just yeah. occurred to me. Also, as someone who has a book due this year, I'm thinking, okay, when our call is over with, I am going to ask chat with D for some help on this scheduling. Um, have you, uh, Sam, have you 
have you played with, or maybe this is hogwash. I don't know. I've heard some kind of prompt engineer expert type people, gurus suggest this little trick. And I do it sometimes myself. I don't know if it works or not, or it's a placebo of almost like coaching the AI up, almost flattering it. So in the in your case, <laughs> saying, hey, I'm launching a, uh, a product at the end of the year. It's just telling it, you are a world-class product launch expert. You have advised multiple CEOs. You ship, you know, almost like kind of stroking its ego. And <laughs> then it will actually, to kind of pattern match, to give yeah. you <laughs> answers, it thinks be more appropriate for a world-class expert product launcher, it would step up its game. Have you experienced experience with that? Is that, or is that all uh, old wife's tale? You know, I, I actually, I do provide my prompts like that. I never thought about it in the lens of um, hyping it up. Mm -hmm. I always thought about it in the lens of like setting the context so that when it is, you know, however, the, the magic of the LLM works it under the hood um, it understands that the most, you know, to go and find uh, the experts or the most hop, top level information that you would give an executive instead of like uh, an intern, right? And so those sort of instructions, mm. I don't think it's necessarily about like hyping it up, but it's more about <laughs> guiding around like the level of, uh, you know, uh, experience or, or content generation that you're looking for. There are certainly some fascinating research papers uh, that you can read on very small changes that you can make in your prompt that, uh, you know, will actually have significant outputs um, or even just anecdotally things like saying, take a deep breath before beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people have, have found that that does help with what's called chain of thought reasoning and giving the model time to think, um, mm -hmm. which tends to like improve its reasoning skills. But one of actually my favorite um, research papers, and now we're getting a little bit into like the, the nerdy academia here. Nerd out. Let's do it. Love it. Cool. So maybe you've, you've read this, but um, the, I believe, I'm pretty sure it was Anthropic, um, published a paper where they uh, they have the biggest context window of mm -hmm. all the LLMs on the market. I believe they have a 200,000. And just, just for listeners real quick, context window yeah. means essentially how many words you it can ingest, right? So 200,000 tokens or words is almost like a, a book length context window. Yeah, exactly. Which is awesome, right? You can put in a whole book and then talk to their LLM about the book. But what they were finding is that sometimes when you put in too much information all at once, the LLM would sort of get a little bit lost it wasn't quite sure like where in all of that context to find the correct information. And so they hmm. ran a study where they added one sentence to their prompt. And I'll tell you what that sentence is. And it made a huge difference. So what they did was they, they put in all of their context and they ran the model and found that it had like a, a 27 or 28% accuracy rate. Okay. Then they added the sentence to the prompt right before the model would start. And the sentence was, um, this is the most relevant sentence in the context, which meant that as soon as the mod they hit enter, the model would first start by completing that sentence, identifying the most relevant sentence in that giant context, and then complete its answer. And that one change increased the accuracy to 98%, from 27% wow. to 98% with that one sentence. So going back to the questions around like ways that you can, you know, help the, you know, prompt engineer to help the model along, maybe it's less about like hyping it up, but more about <laughs> guiding it towards the right. It's like a help me help you, right? Like guide it towards that. Right. right. So, so uh, um, I'm just to make sure I have this, I have this right. Yeah. At the very end of this massive prompt, hundred thousand mm -hmm. words, whatever it is, they write this is the most relevant sentence. What's the mechanism? I'm, I'm, I'm missing something here. Help me out. Yeah. Let's say we upload um, a tour book about uh, San Francisco, like the sure. Forders, Forders tour guide or whatever, yep. right? And then let's say that we want our prompt to be like, um, and it's like a 200 page book. And then what we're asking is for the, the model to um, find me a 
great activity to do with my five-year-old on a Saturday in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's going to, when you add in that sentence, the most relevant sentence in this context is, and then you hit enter on the prompt, Mm -hmm. model will start, will complete that sentence and identify first return the most relevant sentence, which might be an excerpt from like the aquarium, right? Saying the Mm. aquarium is a great place to take your five-year-old on a weekend. And then, so it's, it's, it's identifying the place in the context in that giant book of what's most relevant. Mm -hmm. And then it will start um, responding with its generated content of, oh, here's a great trip to plan for your five-year-old and take him to the aquarium and that sort of thing. So it's a way of helping guide it to first pinpoint the point um, in in all of the information that you you in pass through in the context to mm-hmm. identify the most relevant information, have it tell you that first, almost like showing its work, um, and then it will generate the response. I see. Okay. So you're, I misunderstood. So you're requesting it to identify the That's most relevant it. sentence yes. and that anchors its attention, if you will. And from there, it will generate other relevant answers and analysis. Precisely. Love that. That's a great one. Yeah. Before we move on, my my favorite example of, I love the way you praise it about kind of being more precise on the context of what you want the output to be used for. Um, One example I found, and I've noted out a lot in kind of the, the funsies, asking it to write stories and stuff and being a massive nerd, at one point early in my ChatGPT experimentation, I asked it to write a sequel to or write a, a story summary of a sequel to Star Wars Episode Nine, like the terrible one, Rise of Skywalker, right? Okay. And I, I told it like make it make the tone pretty dark, you know. I kind of gave it some parameters of how I wanted the vibe. And frankly, the story summary was it was pretty good. Like it was way better than whatever JJ Abrams you know, uh, <laughs> released. Um, yes. and it had as an aside to the aside, it was pretty creative on it. it said something like the force has become unpredictable. That was one of the narrative plot Ooh. engines. I'm like, Ooh. that's kind of spicy. Like, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I watched that. <laughs> and like, and like maybe in like, how did it, that back to the question of can AI be creative or not? Like, I don't know, maybe it trolled, some super Star Wars nerd forum from like 2003 and, you know, user Wookiee 1138 has suggested that in deep in the comments and that got ingested to ChatGPT. That's possible, but whatever it was, that's a creative. But anyway, um, my, my one tweak was after this, I said, great, good job. Now tweak all of this to make it more likely to be nominated for an Oscar best picture. Mm. And same overall story, but it did like it elevated the light. The title was more language, more elevated. Cool. There was a deeper emotional arc and it kind of felt like a little more like a film that would have a, 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 a chance at getting yeah. an Oscar nod. Um, yeah. So yeah, so you're, but getting back to our, our agenda here, your overall advice of being specific with, how this can be used, what's the context is great. Let's shift gears to analyzing contents. That's a great use case that I don't think most people, including myself, do enough of, of just feeding it. And it doesn't have to be a full book. It could be some five page PDF, right? Or some article like, hey, summarize this. Sam, how do you use AI to help you quickly analyze contents? Yeah, absolutely. I will will tell you a story of where I really wish that I had had this product uh, and and how I use it now. So when I was um, a product manager at Google, I was on the YouTube team. I was the product manager for the um, super thanks feature, which if you've seen under the buttons of the video, there's like, there's, um, you know, share, and then there's the heart button where you can send like a, a donation to the creator. So that was my product. And when we first launched it, um, you can customize the comment that when you purchase a super thanks, you customize the comment um, and it appears uh, kind of in a different color highlighted in the comment section. And it was great and people loved it. And after we were you know, running the early experiments, I needed to know um, 
how were people using the feature? What were the comments like? What were they using it to express mm -hmm. to the creators? Was it any different than normal comments? Were there certain, you know, um, themes that they were, you know, kind of using this, uh, the functionality for. And so what did I do? I manually read through a thousand mm. YouTube comments. I had to translate them into English. I had to get out all of the, like, you know, the spam comments or the ones that were like just emojis, um, filter <laughs> all of them, read through, manually create my own categories, right? Like mentally on a first pass of like, what are the broad strokes? figure out the categories, then go back through a second or third time and tag every single of the thousand comments with the right category in order to analyze and create a report for you know the, the CEO around how are people using this product. It took me like a week and a half to do hours and oh hours and hours of manual data review, right? What can we do now? We take that spreadsheet of the comments, right? We upload it to an LLM. And we work with it and we say, here are all these comments. I want to understand what people are saying. Give me the top themes, right? Read through all of them. Give me the top themes. Tell me, um, are there any certain patterns, right? And so you can have it do that exact same process that I did on my first pass where I first detected, great, tell me the, you know, 10 major themes across all of these comments and then go back through, create a new spreadsheet for me with the comment and the category of the theme. And I tried, I recreated this experiment. I tried it myself to see, how, you know, this is Love a this. few months ago once I had left YouTube, I just scraped YouTube comments um, to, <laughs> to see what, you know, if I could get it to work. And, you know, you have to work with it at all. Um, it gave me a lot of like uncategorized things. It first got like, first thought I meant sentiment instead of, um, you know, kind of, category of like type of comment. So I gave it more examples, um, did a couple of like few shot, uh, you know, uh, prompt engineering sort of techniques to teach it what I meant. Few shot. Can you, can you unpack that? Just when you give it some, you give an LLM some examples, right? So maybe I take a comment and I categorize it for myself and I do that for like three or four comments. So it primes it, it lets it know what I mean. And then it uses those instructions to then complete the task at hand. So Went, went through this process, you know, it was collaborative in the sense that we did a little bit of back and forth, but ultimately the whole process took me about 30 minutes. Wow. Literally went from, let's say 40 hours of manual data review to 30 minutes of a few rounds of back and forth with this system. So the, the workplace productivity gains of, um, you know, these, these LLMs, especially as they get smarter, uh, is unbelievable. Love that. You've also, Sam, written about using AI to boost your and uh, amplify LinkedIn. Talk about how you've experimented with harnessing AI to step up your LinkedIn game. Oh yeah. Another thing people are really bad about, some, some people I should say, some people are too good at it, uh, but self-promotion and talking about yourself and kind of presenting yourself or marketing yourself in the best way, especially in a really tough job market right now. Um, so I've helped you know, in, in my past and my career, I've been able to help lots of folks with resume writing. Um, people are just really bad at it because we don't learn that mm -hmm. generally mm -hmm. in school, right? Or, or we learn like really bad ways to do it. Um, so I've, you know, gone through and helped a lot of folks with resume writing and, and LinkedIn is essentially a glorified resume, right? You can use it for different types of, of use cases, but ultimately not everyone can afford a, uh, a resume writer or a sure. career coach or has a friend who's, you know, good at it and, and willing to take a look. And so um, one of the ways that you can use AI or something like ChatGPT is to help you better position um, the experiences that you've had on your LinkedIn. Um, and so one way you could do this is kind of similarly to how we talked about with the um, with like uploading your to-do list and, mm -hmm. and having it, you know, create something that's useful for you. Um, upload your resume or just upload a bunch of bullet points of stuff you've done, right? Mm. Um, and it doesn't, so the beauty of it is like, it doesn't have to be good or it doesn't have to be well-written. It doesn't have to, um, you could just be a, a stream of consciousness, but then say, help me write this resume or help me write these, you know, this LinkedIn bio 
I want it to show the impact of what I've done. I want to show, I want to make sure that it effectively communicates X, Y, and Z skills that are really important for, um, you know, hiring managers in my current job search. And so you can use it to help you get better at talking about yourself and positioning your experiences in a positive light when a lot of people are just really, really bad at that sort of like self-marketing or self-positioning. That's so smart. I never would have thought of that. That's, that's a great one. Let's circle back to using AI as a thought partner. What are some of your favorite ways to do that and examples? Yeah, absolutely. It's by far my favorite use case. There is a concept in for, for software engineers and engineering called rubber ducking, which you base it's basically like some I don't know, a person a long time ago would have a rubber duck on his <laughs> desk. Uh, and then when he was trying to work out a complicated problem, would talk to the rubber duck to <laughs> talk out loud. And obviously it wouldn't talk back, um, but, you know, it helped clarify their thinking to have that thought partner. Or, you know, you go to the turn to the engineer sitting next to you and say, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem. Well, I don't know. I work from home. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a, a startup founder. I don't have, you know all the resources in the world to talk to people. But mm -hmm. what I do have is a very helpful thought partner uh, in this amazing website called ChatGPT, where I can give it any sort of um, decision that I'm facing, that mm -hmm. I'm trying to weigh the, you know, a couple of different routes and figure out what's the best path forward. Um, I can give it a, what I like to do is give it um, something that I am thinking about doing, whether that's like a, a right, a decision, a, a strategy, whatever that might be, and ask it for a critique. Say, mm. why is this bad? Where are the blind spots? What am I not missing? How is this going to go wrong? And have it completely like tear down my idea so that I can either have the right rebuttals to it and like really weigh, oh, okay, is that the right thing to do? Or realize, wow, that's a terrible idea. Let's not do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and identify things that maybe I didn't think of myself, right? Like everyone has blind spots. And so by proactively asking it for um, critique is super helpful. Um, it's not going to be perfect. If you went and asked, you know, a, a, a human being, you would certainly get other, you know, different sorts of perspective, but mm -hmm. it is an amazing uh, first step right? And a resource that that I've never had before, which has been awesome. Amazing. And you've already touched upon a few killer ones, such as uh, the tell me the most important sentence. Um, but let's talk prompt engineering a little more. Um, I freaking love, Sam, that you have a spreadsheet devoted to tracking your prompts. You must be thinking constantly about how to tweak and optimize your prompts. What are some of your favorite prompts, strategies, tips, and tricks? Mm, I always like being very explicit about who the audience is, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm writing something or if I'm asking it to do something for myself versus for students who I'm teaching, and I'll explain a little bit of the background of the students that I'm teaching. In my case, I'm creating an AI product management certification course. So teaching product managers how to manage AI products. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'll say, hey, these students are existing product managers, but they don't have necessarily computer science backgrounds. And so use that, you know, that's, that's the audience. Um, or maybe it's an investor and I'm writing an investor memo and I'll specify the investor is the audience. Um, so I, all, one of the things I always do is specify who the audience is. Um, you know, there's obvious stuff like specifying the, the tone and, you know, I, I don't think we need to go into that. I think those are like pretty straightforward. Um, another thing I really like to do, and this is actually in my like um, custom instructions in chat GPT is I always say, ask me if there's first, make sure that you have all of the required information to complete this task. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, Ask me clarifying questions before beginning the task. Mm. And so in every single, and, and this is my system prompt, right? This is my like custom instruction. So in every single conversation that I start, it helps. It actually speeds up my workflow because I can put in an even more vague initial prompt mm. because I've told it, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, ask me clarifying questions. 
And then it will already help me structure the input that it needs to set itself up for success. And so it goes back to that thing we were talking about before, like, help me help you. That's great. Can you, just for listeners who might have bumped up a little bit on that, can you elaborate on your system prompts, why you use it, what it looks like, and some other examples of kind of what you have in there? Yeah, definitely. Wait, let me pull it up and see what I have. Oh, amazing. I love this. Um, Breaking news, real time. And, and while, while, while you're pulling it up, just to make sure for, for those who are kind of tuning in to this AI game, uh, ChatGPT you can now kind of, and Sam, jump in, I'm getting this wrong, kind of preload instructions and parameters that for every single prompt, it will follow. So exactly. You can put in, there's two boxes that you put in, and this is all baked into, this goes into ChatGPT's, you know, yeah. system, which is super cool. Um, but you put, you can put in information that you want it to know about you. So a lot of people might put in like their professional background, their um, level of education that they kind of want to have information generated for, um, you know, if they're like a marketer versus an engineer, like might influence different outputs, any preferences that they might have. Um, and then you can also specify how you want a uh, chat GPT to respond. So kind of like parameters for its response. So mm -hmm. in mine, I have um, a couple of just like, let's get rid of the annoying things. So like, don't remind me that you're a large language model. You know, you get, <laughs> so language great. Model, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah. I don't need to forget that delete. <laughs> um, and also like avoid adding the disclaimers at the end of a, of a response. Like sometimes it'll give you a response yeah. and end like, but I'm not really sure. And maybe you should, you know, <laughs> forget it. Like, I don't need that part yeah. either. Right? I know so you're we, not a doctor. I know like, you're not a doctor. I get it. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we, I, I wanted to get rid of those. Yeah. Um, so my other ones are to ask clarifying questions when the uh, initial response is not clear enough. And I'm kind of just summarizing. Um, so that's how it knows that if I put in something pretty vague, ask me questions, right? Like help me mm -hmm. structure my input and we'll go like step by step. Um, to also try to anticipate and ask questions that would further improve its output. So even like ask me questions that I might not have even known to provide in the first place. Yeah. Right. And so I'm guiding it towards helping to tease out the right input from me, right. To serve as almost like a, like a Socratic coach mm -hmm. to make sure that I'm giving it all this information and asking me the right questions to get the right prompt out of me. And so I'm like having it kind of reverse engineer the prompt, my prompt for itself to make it a really good prompt with less effort. Um, and then finally just ask it to, um, if you don't know the answer to something, say you don't know. Right. I don't want it to make things up. Just say, you know, let's just let's just call a spade a spade. Right, right. Don't Those bullshit me, ChatGPT. Don't do it. Don't hallucinate. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it's not going to prevent hallucinations, but I'd rather at least guide it towards saying like you don't know, as opposed to trying to make something up. And even small things like that, like being explicit. Again, you can't prevent hallucinations or a feature, not a bug. Right. It's how these models work, but being a little bit more explicit and saying, you know, just that one sentence, if you don't know something, say it instead of trying to make it up, that will help try to, you know, optimize the output that you get. Amazing. You've been very generous with sharing all of these tools of yours and you're obviously building a tool. Tell us about Catalyst AI and what the goal is and what it will ultimately look like. Yeah, I would love to. So when I was a product manager at Google, one of my responsibilities was every week I would have to write our team's weekly status update. And it was great. And I would write this nice newsletter and it would go out to all the executives telling us what, or telling them what we did. And writing that was the absolute bane of my existence. <laughs> it took me like two hours every Wednesday morning to go and search across all of my emails and my calendar and ask everybody what the status of their task was and collect all of this information of what was going on on my team. And I just absolutely hated it. I absolutely hated it. And so when I set out with my co-founder, um, Brett Fischler, brilliant engineer, to build our company, it's called Catalyst, we decided that there was a huge opportunity to fix this problem and essentially change the flow of information within companies and within project management and project organization specifically. So the goal of the product at a macro level, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how it works, but Instead of teams, whoever's responsible for 
a project, whether that's like a marketing campaign or a software project launch, right? Like kind of a contained project. Um, instead of that person having to go and pull information out of their teams, right? You're searching for it. You're in status mm -hmm. meetings, you're asking everybody, changing the flow of information. What our product does is it automatically collects it and then surfaces it up. It pushes it to the project manager to eliminate all of that manual, uh, you know, searching and finding, et cetera. So the way that it works is it's a project management assistant that sits where your team collaborates. So right now we support meetings and Slack messages or Slack conversations, understands all of the discussions that are happening about a project, and then detects the actual impact to the project that those conversation has. So if you use a project management software like Jira, mm -hmm. um, we, we figure out what the impact is to the tasks that are in your Jira. If a task needs to be, um, if the status needs to be updated, if it's blocked, if a new task needs to be created coming out of um, like a meeting or a Slack conversation, we detect risks to the project, right? And even just surfacing up those proactive uh, suggestions on a dashboard to the project manager that you're probably you know, lost in a world of your like five projects that you're trying to keep on track and trying to make sure that everything is, you know, staying on the rails. And so we proactively surface risks. Um, and then we document everything. We actually, you know, kind of create, we're like this project historian that mm. creates and records a log of all the decisions that were made, makes sure all the questions were answered, figures out like, you know, records all of the progress so that you're able to actually not only learn from what happened on a project and tie it back to outcomes and improve over time, but ask for information that is buried somewhere, uh, whether in your inbox or lost in a meeting from, you know, a while ago, you can ask like, Hey, what decision did we make in that one meeting? Or it might've been an email. I don't remember about, you know, X, Y, and Z thing and be able to actually search through all that information and find it as opposed to spending half an hour searching everywhere and, uh, you know, doing that yourself. Amazing. What's the timeline on this? What's your goal for launching? Yeah. So we are in, um, we're in closed beta right now um, with a couple of customers. Congratulations. Um, thank you so much. Um, we have a, a, a wait list. If anyone's interested in signing up, you can go to uh, catalystai.com and we plan on launching in a, a couple of months publicly. Last question for you. You are deeply immersed in this space. What predictions do you have for the short to medium term for AI? Oh man, I actually just um, uh, just posted a, a video on the short, like a TikTok on this. So a couple of projections that I have uh, and I'll expand upon what's in the video. Obviously there's launches that I think will come out from like, you know, big tech players this year. One of the things I'm most excited about is a LLM powered mobile operating system or hardware operating system. There are some interesting early attempts, and I love that. Love, you know, getting in the arena and playing around. Um, one actually launched today. It's called Rabbit. Um, I watched the keynote. Super interesting. Um, not sure if it's like exactly the, you know, has product market fit yet. Um, but I think that there's a really interesting opportunity for natural language based operating systems that combine and strike a really delicate balance between automating tasks, which I think a lot of developers over index on what they, how, how automated human beings really want their tasks to be Yeah, and balancing that with um, visibility and control. And so I think there's a really interesting product design question on how you build a natural language powered operating system that gives users the ability to reduce friction in tapping a bunch of apps, um, allows them to find information easier, automate tasks that they want, while not going too far down the assistant delegation path of like, book me a flight to Paris. And it's like, oh my God, now the tickets are in your inbox. Like, no. And I don't think anybody actually wants that. But yeah. there are steps that there is, a, there is a path there that I think really great product design uh, will go down. I'm very interested in the... Uh, the, the company that Sam Altman and Johnny Ive and a lot of folks from his team are mm -hmm. pursuing. And so in terms of predictions, I think that's going to be, uh, that's my most like hotly anticipated uh, upcoming AI product.
That's a great one. Love that. Um, and most important question, how should people track you down as far as uh, websites, Catalyst AI, TikTok, give us the best way folks can find you online. Yeah. The best way to find me online is LinkedIn. Um, super nerdy B2B SaaS founder. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn, Sam Stevens, and um, also website, uh, catalystai.com. You can read my blog, Prompt and Circumstance. Uh, I've taken- Best title ever. Incre- incredible name, by the way. Thank uh, you. I love it so Thank much. <laughs> I love a good pun. Um, I've taken a little bit of a break from writing as I'm building out this um, this AI certification program, but I'll be back. I promise. Sam, thanks so much. Really enjoyed. Would love to have you back on the pod. Best of luck with Catalyst AI. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Bye, Jeff. So there you have it. Thanks again to Sam for being so open and generous to share these tools. So thank you, Sam. I enjoyed it. Looking forward to speaking with Sam again in the future. Thanks again for listening. And as always, please rate it five stars. Share it with your neighbor or pet groomer or hairstylist or, you know, that the ex, the one who got away. <laughs> in any case, thanks again. And we'll see you next time.